Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. Oh, perfect. We have Lucas. <laughs> Hello. Oh, how are you, Lucas? Good. How are you? Good. So I think I just need to check to see if John, um, John might be making his way up here. Looks like he, looks like he might just be joining the room. Um, but in the meantime, Lucas, um, since you weren't able to join us on the main stage, do you want to give us a quick introduction just on what your role is at um, Okapi Conservation? Sure, of course. Um, so my role with the Okapi Conservation Project, I'm actually based in Jacksonville, Florida with John. Uh, we both share, well, I guess not share an office during COVID, but we both uh, work at the Jacksonville Zoo and Gardens. They are very generous with providing us office space to uh, do any sort of work. Um, and so I help coordinate everything from World Okapi Day to marketing to grant writing and development, pretty much uh, it's almost a catch-all position, evaluation of some of our programs, providing uh, advice for our team on the, the ground. Um, but it's basically, a, a, I guess, a catch-all position um, in order to, to make sure things run smoothly. Great. Tell us a bit world of copy you're planning for this year, now that it's shifting to be virtual. So World of Copy Day is October 18th, uh, and we have, in the past, um, we've had zoos sponsor different villages, and we've celebrated in six up to six villages time uh, each year. And we do a lot of uh, races for the kids, uh, soccer games for women groups. Uh, we involve the Mabuti Pygmies to uh, showcase some of their traditional dance and uh, traditions. Um, but this year, we've had to adapt significantly uh, because they're in Congo. You cannot. Uh, collect more or you cannot have meetings of more than 10 people at a time. And so we've uh, moved strictly to radio broadcasts with all of our educational programming. So um, radio broadcasts are a way to connect to everyone in these very remote areas. Everyone has a radio and that's where everyone gets their news and that's where we can reach the widest audience. So we're celebrating that on uh, next Sunday, October 18th. Great. Um, so it looks like we do have John here. So I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping items for anyone who's in this session with us today. Feel free to say hi to us. Tell us where you're tuning in from in the chat. Send any questions to John and Lucas. You can also join us on camera. Um, you can request to uh, come on camera with John, Lucas, and I and ask your questions live on screen. If you do that, I just ask, mute your microphone when you're not speaking to limit any echo that we may have. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and try and bring up a couple people to see if we can bring them up on stage. Um, so Caitlin, while you're doing that, I just wanna say that, that uh, there's an echo. I, okay, sorry. I think you have to close your hop in tab. Okay. All right, good. No. <laughs> Can you hear an echo? A little bit. A little bit. Not too bad. All right. So I just want to say our staff from uh, Congo can't be with us. I really wish they could. But our it, it's rainy season now, and we have mm -hmm. to unplug the router for every thunderstorm, which happens every day. So real, it's real problem. So, but I'm so glad they were in the video. We got to meet them and. We have many more really talented people in the Congo. Great. Thank you, John. Yeah, it was really it was really wonderful to get to hear from both Bear Samanga in the presentation. Um, along those lines, how is your team doing right now um, in regards to COVID? How how is everyone? Made so presently, COVID is not in our area uh, that we know of. Mm -hmm. uh, the major towns of Bunya, Baini, Goma have cases, but the majority of COVID cases are in Kachasa, the capital, a thousand miles away. And so our our staff has been are totally educated on what to avoid uh, contact and washing hands. So we are we are doing uh, very well that way. This, and, but everybody's still very aware of the possibility. Um, so it looks like we have a question in the chat from Isaiah, and he's wondering how how do you manage running an organization from abroad? Um, how has the amount of time you've spent um, in the reserve changed over time? 
And if you could also share maybe how often you guys do visit the DRC in a typical year. Well, in the beginning of the project, I was there an awful lot. It was 33 years developing, going, growing the project. And as uh, but over time, we had a, such a talented team there and I had other responsibilities. So I, I would go three, four, five times a year to the Congo. Uh, Lucas has joined us. He's gone a number of times. And uh, so we hope we can, we're developing a team that can manage this project. That's our goal. Mm -hmm. A Congolese team led by Congolese, and we're uh, trying to build the capacity, and we are building the capacity for this to happen. So that's our goal right right now. Great. Hi, Cheryl. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl. Where? Where? Oh, she's gone. Oh, she disappeared. <laughs> uh, maybe. She Um, Paula asks, have the civil wars and um, guerrilla wars affected the Okapi at all? Well, they definitely affect the Okapi because the main effect is effective conservation action is impeded by their, by their presence. The rangers have a very dangerous job doing patrols. Uh, you cannot cover all the reserve because certain areas are too dangerous. So definitely impacted. But Okapi are so wise in the forest, it's really hard for them to be encountered. And so they, they're just being displaced. They're displaced out of an area by people and they'll move back in after the people leave. So, I, but the real issue is we can't have a conservation presence to control legal activity. Yeah. Um. So speaking of some of the dangers that, that you guys face in the field, um, Sharon asked, can you talk more about the dangers your team faces from illegal gold miners? Have you, have you guys um, actually had um, issues with, with your own team experiencing those mines? We haven't had uh, trouble with the miners ourselves. Our, our team is embedded in the communities, part of the communities, well-respected. And, and uh, the leaders of the communities, uh, you know, provide the protection for them. So I really, is, we can talk to the miners, we can work with the people, and that's our goal. And we want our, our education team to be able to do that, which they do. And I think that the real key here is the miners are just poor people trying to make a living. And uh, when they're evacuated, it's usually, it's usually safely, they're evacuated, they're asked to leave by the rangers. It's just that the people are poor and, and they're hungry and it's, it's a very, very difficult situation to try to find solutions to, to make people feel that uh, there's other places they can go. Just to make it clear, a lot, most of the miners are not from the area around the Okapi West. They're from major cities far away. This is a gold rush mentality. They come from Kisangani all over the country to come here for the gold. Uh, so the local people are negatively impacted by all the trouble the miners cause and the disruption to the, their daily lives. So really, our educators are, are admired by the communities for just kind of help bring us under control. Yeah. I think one thing I really respect from your program is how you are so deeply intertwined with the community there. Um, because I, you have done some work with women's programs and you've done some sewing campaigns so that they have livelihoods um, there. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, I think uh, Becca mentioned in the chat that you did a recent campaign with, with well, Lucas can answer that because he's been <laughs> heavily involved in that. Personally so, and professionally. Yeah, personally and professionally. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. I'm done with making masks. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so we work very closely with uh, five women's groups around the reserve, uh, in an, around the reserve, and we provide them uh, capacity building opportunities and materials to build their own uh, small uh, micro enterprises to sell these items in the, the, the markets so that they can um, uh, generate a little bit of income for their families. And so each one of these women's groups, they sell these items and the money goes into a collective pot that anyone in the women's group can pull upon if they fall down on uh, hard times, if they need to purchase food for the week or if they need to put a new roof on their house. Uh, and it's only the women that actually have access to that fund, those funds. Uh, and personally, um, once COVID hit, 
I had actually brought several um, uh, bolts of fabric back from uh, one of the recent visits to Congo, and I started making my own masks and selling them um, to a lot of my friends and family and some Okapi supporters. I'm finished making masks right now, but I raised about uh, $12,500, and that's going to uh, one of our uh, big construction projects that's going to be starting probably uh, by the end of this year or next year. And so um, I've kind of had a, a, a very strong uh, connection to sewing. My mother taught me to sew when I was very young. So I have a, a very close connection to the women's groups. Great job. You did a fantastic job. It was Thank fantastic. You. Um, I see we lost Caitlin. Uh, so I guess I'm going to be a little bit of a. I see a Caitlin. I see Caitlin. Oh, I see Caitlin. I, I lost your video, Caitlin. Oh, I'm still here. I'm here? sorry. If, if, you lost, if you did lose my um, okay. video, I am still here. Hopefully. Um, okay. <laughs> I was like, I'll just jump in there and start asking questions. But thank, yeah, thank you, Lucas. I love how you just hop in. Um, so we did. I one thing we haven't been able to touch upon yet is just some of the features and characteristics of Okapi. Um, Susan asked, Okapi, and do they live in groups? Or do they have breeding herds? Um, yeah, if you could just talk a little bit more about uh, the behavior behaviors of okapi. Yeah, the biology of okapi is pretty unique. Uh, solitary animals, uh, the male and female come to breed for breeding, and and uh, we I th we mentioned that some other place, but the they use infrasound to communicate okapi sound below our hearing, and more importantly below that of a leopard. And so the male and female will get together to breed, and 14 months later, a calf will be born. And that's the only time there's a social unit is the mother calf bond and uh, they stay together for about a year uh, the calf will hide for the first two or three months in a nest and only come get out to nurse with its mother two or three times a day and this to avoid again detection by leopards and so this is a major major predator on Wakapi is the leopard and it's a very high density of leopards in Uturi for so i think the other really neat thing is the the territories are quite small because the foliage is so thick. So a female okapi weighing 700 to 800 pounds only has a four or five square kilometer territory. A male may be 10 to 12 square kilometers. So the density okapi can be very high for a large ungulate compared in the, in the rainforest. So that's why we can have in the 13,700 square kilometers of the okapi wild reserve, 4,000 to 5,000 okapi, which is a really amazing density for a large ungulate. Great. I'm going to see if I can bring a couple people on screen. We'll see if this works. But in the meantime, we've had a few. Oh, here we go. Hi. Hi, Steven. Oh, I like the mask. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of Lucas's masks there. That's one of Lucas's masks. Oh, <laughs> this is. <laughs> Steven, no, you have no, he's done. He's retired. <laughs> Uh, my wife is so happy that we don't have the sound of the sewing machine anymore. Okay. Did you have a question, yeah. Andrea? No, I just wanted oh. to show oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Now I'm going to get start getting so many requests for these masks. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, speaking no, of the masks, speaking of the masks, we've had a few people in the chat ask how they can help, either as an American or maybe they're in Europe, they're living far away from the DRC. How can they help? What are you guys needing? Well, basically, we promised our staff we would support them to the end of the year, uh, everything. Funding is down across all nonprofits because, and we're a, we're a pack hit it because zoos are our major funders and zoos have been closed. And so we're not we're not getting our zoo funding. So core funding for our staff is our greatest need. We're writing grants for our agroforestry, for our education programs, and but to pay for the fuel in the trucks and the food in the, in the, uh, for our staff and for travel mm -hmm. and uh, their salaries to support their families. That's what we need the most right now. And uh, our supporters, we're we're counting on them helping us. Uh, we're using our cash reserve right now to carry us through this year, but we're really going to need to build that back up next week. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I think we'll take. Can I add, can I add yeah. to that? Uh, and if, if, for no, if you don't have the capacity to support financially, I think um, we we rely heavily on 
um, people around the world, one, to visit zoos with Okapi, and because we do receive a lot of funding from zoos, um, but also just telling people about Okapi. That's one of our biggest hurdles uh, mm -hmm. locally, is just letting people know that the Okapi is an animal itself. It's a very specific species. It's not a hybrid at all. Um, and just sharing information about Okapi and the plight of Okapi and the work that we're doing. It's, and that, they're, that, in that, they're classified as endangered. And they're yeah. endangered. And so really, mm -hmm. really, that's the main thing. You're right, Lucas. Awesome. Andrea got um, <laughs> And if you, if uh, anybody tuning in is on, Okapi Conservation Project is active on there. So those are definitely places that you can check out, learn more about Okapi, share their posts, tell your friends about Okapi, um, and help spread the word. Um, I th I think um, I think we might want to wrap it up for now. Um, it looks like the other presentations are so. Um, thank you, everyone, for taking the time to send in your send in your chats. Um, we will see you over on the blue stage for the presentation by Dr. Jane Goodall. Thank you, John thank, and Lucas. Thank you all very thank much. Everyone. Thank you all for, for supporting WCN. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Take Bye. care. Bye. Be safe. Everyone be safe. Please.